If I could have a superpower, it would be to control time. More time to sleep, more time to relax, more time to catch my breath. I'm sure that those of you who work in the NHS would love to do the same. But superheroes rarely get to choose their powers. In fact, some even come to see them as a curse. And I can understand that, because I've had a kind of superpower bestowed on me, and one that definitely has its pros and cons. I'm a trans man, and I often have the power of invisibility. Sometimes it's a relief. When I'm walking down the street late at night, or I'm applying for a new job, I don't have to worry that I'll face discrimination, abuse, maybe even danger because of who I am. Sometimes I wish I wasn't so invisible. When I go to LGBT spaces with my wife, we can feel people's quizzical looks, but it's a small price to pay for not having to worry about where we go on holiday or whether we'll be stared at as we walk around the supermarket, because people assume we're straight and cisgender, which means not trans. So, if you were invisible for a day, what would you do? When the trans community were asked that question, thousands of people gave the same response. Strange. They said, go swimming. It's a sad glimpse into how restricted the world can be when you don't feel safe. So if you were invisible for a day, you might have some fun. You might steal a priceless diamond. You might go to the middle of Trafalgar Square and dance like genuinely no one was watching. But what if you needed to access healthcare? What would you do then? Maybe you'd shout and scream until someone noticed you were there. Maybe you'd resort to treating yourself. And actually, this isn't uncommon. Almost 20% of trans people in the UK are self-medicating with hormones bought online. Maybe you'd wait it out and hope the invisibility wore off before you felt worse. Like I said, this superpower has its pros and cons. But can you imagine the relief when you find someone who really sees you? The first time I went to speak to my GP about the idea of transitioning, I was really nervous. This was the culmination of several years of agonizing, of self-doubt, discomfort, and difficult conversations. This appointment felt like the moment the rest of my life could begin. I was met with disdain and unhelpful advice. My GP refused to use my correct pronouns, referring to me as young lady in all of my referral letters and appointments. I found out it would be several years before I could be seen by gender identity services. As you might imagine, this was, this was a crushing blow. And support in the meantime was nowhere to be found. Fast forward a bit, my first cervical screening. It was several years late because I didn't receive a reminder. It involved a really difficult interaction with a very nervous person who just wasn't expecting a man to walk into the room. The lab then automatically rejected my sample because there was an M on the label. So I had to do it all again. But this time it was different. This time, they really saw me. They got me. It was game-changing. I went to a place called Clinic T in Brighton. Clinic T is a sexual health service for anyone who identifies as trans, non-binary, or gender variant. The questions I was asked before my appointment told my doctor everything she needed to know to meet my needs. Because my doctor knew about me, my appointment was more physically comfortable. I felt like my identity was respected instead of ignored. 
And she was also able to fill me in on some really important stuff. Did I know that my risk of actually acquiring STIs was higher? Did I know about risk of unwanted pregnancy? Did I know what screenings I needed and how often? Because I wouldn't receive a reminder. I learned so much about my health in that 15 minute appointment that I left feeling empowered. But I also left feeling let down by the realization that I've been invisible to healthcare professionals for so long. Being invisible, they hadn't spotted me. And I can't blame them for that. But all they needed to do was ask, who's there? And we are beginning to ask more questions to find out who's there, like asking about sexual orientation on our monitoring forms. But why do we need to know? Well, what if I told you that 40% of lesbian and bisexual women falsely believe that they don't need a cervical screening? That around 50% of trans people in the UK have considered or attempted suicide? That every week in London, 15 gay and bisexual men are diagnosed with HIV. Not only that, but the LGBT community have higher rates of smoking, of drug and alcohol use, and of mental health issues. If some of these people are invisible to us, how can we hope to address these inequalities? But when we're thinking about inequality, invisibility isn't the whole issue. If you're able to do so, can I please ask you to stand and stay standing if you're over 32 years old? I promise I'm not taking notes. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, you're in a safe space. Okay, interesting. Thank you. What if I told you that everybody standing in this room right now has outlived the life expectancy of a black trans woman? in the US today. This is a lethal combination of visibility that leads to sexist, racist, and transphobic violence. Murder is a contributor to this statistic, but also invisibility. HIV and AIDS and suicide are part of the picture here too. I imagine that those of you standing might be feeling pretty visible right now. And I get that sometimes that is unwanted and uncomfortable. So go ahead and take a seat. Thank you. If services were open to and appropriate for these women, if services saw patients not just as trans or as black or as high risk, but also as people they needed to get to know, then maybe we'd be quicker to pick up on the fact that someone could be facing a whole multitude of hardships and an appointment would become an opportunity, not just to treat, but to really see and to hear and to connect someone with what they most needed. How do we begin to do this? By asking, who's there? What is your gender? Is it different from the one you were assigned at birth? What's your sexual orientation? Three simple questions, but they have the potential to completely change an interaction for the better if we know how to ask them and how to respond. I should say that not all LGBT people welcome these questions because we need to do more than just ask. We need to make it safe to say yes, to tick that box, to be seen. Barack Obama introduced sexual orientation monitoring during his time as president. It was widely celebrated. Trump then reversed this decision, and it was actually met with sighs of relief from many in the community who felt they could no longer trust their government with this information about them. It's no wonder people don't feel safe to answer this question yet. The NHS offered aversion therapy. That's things like induced vomiting, chemical castration, 
and electroshock therapy until 1980. That's less than 40 years ago. I've met LGBT people who remember being subjected to this. We've just seen Alan Turing added to the 50 pound note, if you've been lucky enough to see one. <laughs> it's a fantastic celebration of a man who was let down by the society he served, a victim of aversion therapy and of suicide. But these issues don't just exist in black and white photos. This was still going on in 1980. And many people still carry this fear and anxiety around accessing healthcare today. Many LGBT people I know can remember a time where a clinician skirted around asking about their lives and their identities, not wanting to make assumptions, but also being unsure how to raise the question. I went to school during a time that a law called Section 28 was still in effect. What Section 28 did was effectively outlaw schools and educators from acknowledging LGBT identities. I can still remember the climate of shame and silence that surrounded me at school. Many of today's clinicians and today's LGBT community went to school under this law. And it shows. It shows in higher rates of STIs. It shows in poorer mental health outcomes. It shows in our shame and embarrassment. It takes time to undo the invisibility and the silence and to make it OK to step out. As well as skirting around these issues, many LGBT people can remember going to appointments armed with clinical best practice guidelines legal documentation, links to educational resources. And while some of us are more than happy to do this, educating professionals can be an exhausting task that you have to repeat with each new person you meet. LGBT education is still lacking in our medical curriculum, and we live in a world where hate crime is rising, where protesters, protesters are lining up outside schools that want to teach an inclusive curriculum where violence and suicide are still big issues. As professionals, asking these questions helps us to support people in the right ways. But outside of your roles, as members of society, I hope you'll be helping to build a world where it's safe to be seen. So where do we start? Changing hearts, minds and systems can feel like moving mountains especially when the NHS employs 1.5 million people. That's many, many more than our armed forces. It's the world's fifth biggest organization. I heard a quote recently. It said, the man who moves mountains begins by carrying away small stones. And it got me thinking, with 1.5 million of us, we could shift an awful lot of stones. And it's these small acts of asking the question, of showing your support for LGBT communities, a flag, a lanyard, a poster, asking and using the right pronouns, of talking about us in the curriculum. When we put these small things together, they start to become something quite big. These small stones save lives. We know this only too well at the LGBT Foundation, an organization that's been supporting the LGBT community since 1975, where the helpline set up over 40 years ago still rings many of the same worries. Where one of our volunteers actually said, this poster saved my life. During a difficult time, he'd seen our LGBT helpline poster up at his local surgery. But it wasn't us who turned things around for him. It was his GP. Met with warmth, respect, and a knowledge of where to turn next, this 10-minute appointment had turned into a lifeline. Next year, I need to have a hysterectomy. And again, I'm really nervous. Will the wards be single sex? If so, after a hysterectomy, 
Will I be put on a men's ward? Will the surgeon speak loudly about my procedure in the middle of the room? Is there anything different about a hysterectomy if you've been on testosterone for years? Will people even get my pronouns right? I hope somebody sees me, understands what might be difficult, talks to me about them in advance. Even if they don't know the answers yet, I hope they ask the questions. At the LGBT Foundation, we have a program called Pride in Practice. Pride in Practice exists to support healthcare professionals to feel more confident when they're working with the LGBT community. When I go to speak with professionals about Pride in Practice, I'm often met with anxiety about new words, terms, and phrases. It's hard to remember it all. It's a mouthful, it's complicated. Well, I'm here to tell you it, it doesn't have to be. Good healthcare is a bit like making a good cup of tea. We know the ingredients. I like a strong tea with one sugar, maybe a sweetener. I'm more likely to have a sugar though. Um, but we're all different. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is we can't make someone a good cup of tea unless we ask. Focus on getting each cup right rather than all those orders you might have to take in the future. Just breathe. Instead of worrying about what might happen if you get it wrong, focus on what it might mean for someone if you get it right. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's just a few key ingredients. In your services, do you ask who's there? Or do you assume you know? What small stones can you move to make your spaces safe, welcoming, even life-saving? Perhaps your superpower could be seeing people like me and making us feel like we're not invisible anymore. Thank you. <laughs>